aquí. Hold on a second. Um, so in order to do this, I have students read uh, Leonard Pitt's essay, which discusses presenting our own positions to others and sharing our opinions and, and our responses in, um, on important issues. I also teach introductions, just very introductory things on demagoguery and triangulating data. Um, we analyze diverse presentations of the same information coming from different, you know, quote unquote, sides of the issues. Um, so for example, we will look at uh, ben Ferguson's Facebook page, um, and then we will compare and contrast that to something like Occupy Democrats' Facebook page. Um, we see there that the same strategies of persuasion and or manipulation um, are being used on both sides. And we discuss not so much the incorrectness of either of these, these so again, quote unquote, sides, so much as the issues that we see with the presentation of information and the ethics involved in how that information is being presented. Um, and we see a lot of very similar strategies and tactics, um, such as name calling or um, taking things out of context and things like that. So students are analyzing a particular argument. And then after doing that research and that analysis, they are able to then present their informed response in addition to what they found through their analysis. Building from project one, students analyze a propaganda campaign of their choosing. Um, I do provide them with a list of options because it is difficult to, to just kind of think of one, um, but they can also propose their own ideas as well. Uh, here students are learning to not only identify propaganda, but also respond to it again. Um, debunking is part of the project goals, but they are also encouraged, encouraged to um, discuss why it's significant or particularly problematic and how others need to be able to see such information for what it is. Um, an example that I like to use is um, the Church of Scientology. That's an example um, I discuss with them in terms of the significance of a campaign, the wide reaching uh, type of campaign that it is, and also the importance of being able to recognize it because uh, several people have um, actually died from practices related to Scientology. That's part of my dissertation research. And so I go over those kinds of things with them as examples um, that they always find very interesting. Uh, those are, that's an extreme example, but it shows the importance of what we're doing um, and why we need to find ethical good information. Um, they do not analyze things like World War II propaganda. It's all modern current campaigns. So that's an important part of it as well. Um, we wanna keep things very relevant and recent. Some notable student projects um, analyzed and responded to things like anti-vax campaigns, um, anti-feminism campaigns. Another student explored TikTok as a particular, particularly useful medium for propaganda. So not actually a campaign, but the medium of TikTok, which was very interesting. Um, slightly different take on the project, but again, extremely enlightening and effective, and we were able to think about um, the use of social media and new media platforms and how those things can um, take, take us into the propaganda realm as well. In the final project for the course, students were invited to attempt to create change in our society. Um, so having discussed misinformation and propaganda in the course previously, they were now more prepared to develop nuanced topics and more importantly, perhaps they were able to, or they were capable of um, avoiding misinformation, avoiding propaganda, avoiding unethical research practices themselves. Um, so students were able to conduct good, thorough research um, they were able to present their action components in more ethical ways. For example, rather than um, researching what they already believed about a social issue, we discussed things like avoiding confirmation bias and locating unbiased sources as much as possible. 
Uh, we discussed the process of discovery in research and compared it to um, the difference between the discovery process of research and then simply looking for sources that aligned with the beliefs we already hold. Um, students worked on projects such as writing petitions, writing a letter to the governor, creating a website, um, and lots of other kinds of projects. These were very well, well researched. They were very specific, very narrow. Um, for example, one student wrote a petition for increased mental health services on our campus. Um, another wrote a letter to government officials, local government officials to advocate for um, funding for a local bridge repair. There was a low income community that was everyone who worked you know, across the river was having to drive about 30 miles out of the way pretty much every day because the bridge was never repaired and it was a low income community. So they wrote to government officials with lots of great research there. Um, another student wrote a PSA discussing um, their recent research on marijuana and the dangers that we don't often hear about in the media. So instead of where we might typically just see a paper on why we should legalize marijuana, they were instead uh, speaking to a larger audience and looking at recent research on um, issues with lung damage and things like that that um, aren't usually discussed. So it was a very interesting project and they were using what they had uh, previously learned about misinformation and good research and good argumentative skills and then putting it to use in this kind of social action activist sort of way. Overall, uh, the three projects presented here worked very well to scaffold toward greater engagement in research and on recognizing and limiting the use of bad sources. Um, students reported that they were comfortable speaking about these social issues um, and that they were comfortable speaking about rhetoric and propaganda in other classes and in other situations. They also often brought up or, or actually would bring in examples that they wanted to discuss in class. Oh, I'd like to emphasize that they wanted to discuss that in class with each other and with me, um, which, was, which was amazing. Um, for example, they would share with us um, memes or news, you know, fake news stories that their grandparents had shared on Facebook. Uh, we discussed these as a class and we applied our concepts to them. So we would apply um, demagoguery or trickery or misinformation ideas to those memes and stories and things like that. Led to excellent conversations. Um, I saw students engaging in their research in new and exciting ways. And I saw them truly, um, truly, honestly, I think caring about the work that they were doing, whether it was analysis or responding to something or taking action. Um, so I was seeing this as active citizenry, but they're being active citizens. They started thinking about um, political campaigns. They started thinking about voting, voting rights and things like that as well. The importance of voting, I think as well. Overall, I feel, um, that a focus on the, the chirotic moment really increased students' awareness and their desire to learn more about the concepts that we covered. So it was very interesting that um, they became so active in the class and they were bringing in examples and wanting to apply the concepts that we discussed to those examples. Um, overall, I'm continuing to work on this process continuing to develop this approach further each semester that I work on it. Um, but I've consistently found students to be overall just more engaged, more active when I'm teaching with these strategies um, and when I'm inviting them to bring in ideas and bring in examples that, um, that they see taking place in the moment. I mean, I think that just kind of brings a lot of relevance to the class. Um, so overall, that's my approach. I welcome any thoughts and, and questions on this. Uh, thank you so much for your time.
Oh, I think you're, I think you're muted, sorry. <laughs> I've been sitting chats, so that's it. Manira, would you like to present now or would you like to wait and uh, take a little more time to prepare? Yeah, I can go, sorry about that. I was just like having my computer dying issue, nothing, you know, unusual. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, yeah we're I all can good. go now. All right, so um, let me go ahead and introduce you. Um, and, and I'm sorry, also, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Manira Mutmaina. Is that close? Uh, Mutmaina, yeah, you got it. Mutmaina, okay. <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know what, and also, as I found out uh, with Sarah, that some of these biographies are out of date because I guess people wrote them a year ago when they first applied. Um, but right now I have that you're currently a graduate student working towards your doctoral degree at uh, the Department of English at George Mason University. Is that still correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, your research includes, but is not limited to, language acquisition, writing studies, EFL and ESL studies, and rhetoric and composition studies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll turn the floor over to you now. Thank you. Um, let me just uh, quickly see if I can share this. I think I can. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to figure out if this is working. Uh, can you guys see this? Yes. Okay. I just want to put it in presenter mode, yeah, so that we're yeah, not yeah. seeing all your notes. There we go. Yeah, I mean, just like, the, I am not a fan of the presenter mode anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, so let me see. So my study is about one uh, a project. Hi, first of all, sorry, I'm Munira. Um, like Lauren said, um, I am a doctoral student and I'm working on, I was working on something last year as with one of my professors and a couple of my peers, uh, which turned out to be like something else. And then I ended up doing this. And then the idea was part of a much bigger project, which I'm still working on. And this is kind of like a sub project under that, um, that kind of panned out um, eventually. So my idea is like writing in the pandemic, a study into ultragraduate graduate student writer experiences. Um, I was planning to like, I started off with focusing on um, like something like the experiences of the uh, graduate student writers during the pandemic, especially because last year it was um, with the transition from um, all you know, traditional in-person classes to online classes, we had that shift of people feeling, you know, a sense of loss of community. Like I know as a student, I felt that multiple times where I felt like, okay, I can not, no longer go to the library and check out a book uh, the way I used to because um, I'm, I'm far away. I was far away from campus at that point of time because I, I was moving. And then there were all these experiences that made me realize that this, this must be something common across all the graduate student, but my focus uh, was like, I wanted to focus on the L2 users or like non-native speakers, English users specifically, because I know a lot of these students are coming in from other countries or other places. And when you transition like that, their, their, whole, their whole basis or their whole, you know, they work, um, they stay or they work or they function, Regard, revolving that campus environment, um, you know, surrounding that, um, that institutional um, support, the peer support, the faculty support. So what happens is when you shift them or when you transition, when such a big transition happens where everything is uncertain, a lot of these other crises um, comes um, in the front and, you know, um, causes insecurities and like, issues in their like mental health, physical health, and in general, like their life writing experiences as a graduate student. So my focus was observing their writing experiences um, in general. So I took in doctoral and master's graduate students, both and the participants, like you said, were L2 users. Um, the responses I collected were from interviews and surveys, and the overarching theme was um, how have the disruptions of the global pandemic impacted the writing lives slash projects of graduate student writers. And my research questions were how have the 
L2 writing experiences of the graduate students um, changed due to the COVID-19 pandemic and what type of resources slash support are they able to access as graduate student writers during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, so I was looking at some of the resources and like I said, what happened based on several of the pre-COVID uh, studies on online classes, as well as some of the studies that uh, were conducted during that uh, like whole year of like 2020, I saw this idea of people always bringing up how peer support is crucial, but at the same time, when you are in these online spaces, it's not always as, as easily available or readily available, or not just peer support, but having that sense of community, which is so easier to get because we, I remember a lot of my colleagues or a lot of my professors would share how they were no longer having those conversations, you know, in the, in the cafeteria or in the, uh, you know, just when they're heating up their food or in the corridors. So there were all these normal day-to-day -day things that they were missing out on and that sense of community, that sense of belonging or that, that those social interactions that they were having in those spaces reduced to nothing. So how has that affected not only their personal lives but also how they see their writing or how they see them themselves as graduate writers? So my for my study, I took 36, it was a bigger study, like I said, but um, because I was focusing on a specific population, say to say like L2 student writers. So I did, uh, didn't get a, like a lot of students in there, but I had 36 graduate students, uh, 24 of them were PhDs, eight were MAs and other others were like, these were termed others. So probably just certificate courses or non-graduate degree level courses. Um, and in total, who participated in those surveys and 16 of them were in some kind of writing and rhetoric program in their respective institutions and the remaining 20 were from other fields. So the focus, I, the question was there because um, I come from a writing rhetoric program. Um, so my, you know, like at the department I'm studying in the Department of English in George Mason is um, like offers two programs and I'm in the writing and rhetoric program. And the other fields that we had like creative arts, uh, people, creative writing, we had linguistics and people from other fields um, responding to the questions and the surveys. The survey uh, had multiple questions. I won't get into the details because there were a lot. The survey revealed that approximately 61% of the L2 writer respondents sharing that their institution, department, program, and slash campus community supports them as a graduate student writer, which was a good thing. About 11 per participant, 11 per, uh, percentage of participants said that they do not have such support, and about 14% shared they do have support, but they think it could be improved, and rest of the students just said you know, NA or not applicable. It was a good thing to see how they felt positively about receiving support for the most part, which uh, which is something to think of because I think uh, like right away when I think of things closing down or institutions closing down, the first thought that came to my mind was how are students going to access all these resources that we usually have access to otherwise like when it, when the campus is open. So that was a good thing uh, for me, like when I was looking at it, it was surprising. Then there was this other question which, uh, which consisted of several sub questions. So this was the bigger question. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated, coincided with, and uncovered a number of other social political issues and challenges in the US. Please rate how much of the following have impacted you as a graduate student writer during the COVID-19 pandemic with three being major impact and one being little impact. And the sub questions had questions about issues such as race, gender, pol politics, health, because that's also around the time when the presidential race was going on. So it was like a very, um, how to say, like a very ripe time of all these things happening at the same time in that whole year. We had so many movements happening. We had the Black Lives Matter movement going on. So there were a lot of things that happened during that time. So all these factors were considered for that as well. And as you can see, uh, about like 44 per percentage of students felt like the social unrest uh, was causing them, um, uh, like was impacting their lives as a, as a graduate student writer. The work-life balance that they had to do all of a sudden was affecting them as well. The mental health, as a lot of people, 56% to be specific, had uh, like experiences um, with like 
somehow majorly got influenced by COVID-19 pandemic. A citizenship or immigration, which is unique for the L2 writer, like I said, because a lot of these students are international students and their, their, um, student, their immigration or their visa is tied to them being um, a full-time student in the, in the US. So being a full-time also means uh, abiding by all these rules of how many online classes can you take or how many on-campus classes you can take. So they, th there was a time, and if I don't know if you've uh, read about that, but there was a time when the, uh, their, the, the immigrations came with this policy of, of send, asking all the international students to go back to their respective countries because since they were taking online classes, they could legally not be in the US for that time period, which caused a lot of unrest and a lot of anxiety among the international student population, which was of course then reverted back a few days later. Um, but that, that period was a very uncertain um, and, and a moment of um, crisis for those specific, like those students especially who did not have the means or the, the you know, any alternatives to fall back to because at that time a lot of the countries were also having travel bans so saying that you have to go back to your country um, wasn't also exactly a solution for many of them so there was that crisis as well because they didn't know whether they should stay will they be illegal will they be uh, to, you know deported and so on and so forth language barriers um, wasn't that much of a of an issue for them um, so wasn't like the gender inequality, uh, which was again a good thing. Racial inequality, 22%. A lot of people faced, felt, felt that the COVID-19 was um, impacting them um, racially. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that there were a lot of talks and a lot of in, um, events and a lot of um, you know incidents going on around race and the, talk, the conversations we were happening might have had something to do with that. Uh, the common activities such as going to the library, making use of the library space uh, was no longer possible for most of these students due to the pandemic, which is why more than half, like about 53% of the people responded that access to the library being significantly impacted has also affected their reading writing processes as an L2 graduate student. Um, I remember uh, going to the you know, academic social media platforms during that time, be it Reddit, be it Twitter, and seeing all these people, especially those who are at the cusp of graduating, who are working on their thesis, who are working on their dissertation, getting frustrated because they simply could not access the resources they really needed. And there was no way they could find a digital copy of it or they could access because there was this time when everything was closed because nobody knew what to do. Um, so there was, the, there, was, there was this period where people were um, facing issues in terms of how they could access the library or the resources that it offered. Um, other resources except for peer advice do not seem to have been impacted as gravely as the library access if you look at the, the responses. So graduate student write-ins because a lot of the things moved to being virtual um, during last year. So write-ins, I remember we, even in our program, we had uh, virtual write-ins um, every, uh, like on, on a frequent basis. So the students could, you know, log into Zoom and then just do their thing, do their writing as, as uh, for the time period. Other services, or events or services like in terms of non-writing cultural events, those were also uh, being you know, celebrated or being conducted on, even on a virtual platform. So they didn't feel there was, th those things were being impacted as much. Uh, so the library was the only one with such a great number. Uh, also, uh, I, the reason I picked a different graphics for this one was because I felt like I could relate to anxiety being that. Um, on a personal level, because I feel like when when I'm thinking of anxiety, I'm just like, okay, so this is like a mountain. Okay, so this is like um, the something that I can climb, but then sometimes it gets too much and it's overwhelming, and I'm not sure if I'm going to ever reach the peak. Uh, but so yeah, I just felt like you know changing the graphics for that one a little bit. So before pandemic, about 22% of these L2 graduate student writers felt anxiety or depression about specific writing tasks to be a very challenging issue. And 17% of them felt the same regarding anxiety or depression about their writing in general. But in uh, um, as, as, as the COVID-19 afterwards said, majority of the students, like 15%, felt it was somewhat challenging issues, issue dealing with anxiety and depression about their writing in general. So uh, 
it it was so it wasn't as big as I expected it to be so, because I felt like all these students were already dealing with anxiety and depression as it was, even if the COVID-19 weren't there. But um, some of those issues might have affected their overall anxiety, but then their their you know their attention from pre-existed to pre like their attention to other pre-existing issues that they had before pandemic kind of shifted towards all these these pre these uh, COVID-19 related factors when the pandemic hit. So it was kind of like their their focus shifted, but the anxiety kind of remained the same. So the amount was similar. Uh, the majority of the students in uh, in the, like the L2 graduate students, they found that uh, like uh, they were they said that several of several aspects of their writing were very challenging during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, because of some of these issues that you see in the graphics. So incorporating feedback, finding the time to write. Again, it connects to the work-life balance because a lot of this, these were work from home uh, parents, single parents trying to juggle um, their writing time and their like how their duties as a parent and like falling short and feeling bad about it. And all these kind of factors that came up in the interviews and the surveys, approximately 58% of them had issues with focus and the same amount faced challenges in maintaining a regular routine. About 56% found it very challenging in regards to their writing in general. And around 61% considered the same regarding writing about specific tasks. In terms of incorporating feedback, about 53% of the participants shared that it was not challenging before the pandemic, whereas 50% uh, of them found it somewhat challenging during the pandemic. Because again, incorporating feed feedback, I think a lot of the uh, instructors, a lot of the club peer reviews were happening online. So even though they had that support, at the same time, incorporating feedback uh, also had to do with the idea of going to the professor and being able to talk to them in person and just discussing your ideas and just talking about okay, how to make my writing better and so on and so forth. For the second part of the study, I break, broke it down to two set of quotes. So the first cycle of coding included the following categories, um, emotional experiences during COVID-19, writing during COVID-19, experiences related to their identities, institutional resources and support, peers slash colleagues slash cohort resources and support, non-institutional and non-professional resources and support. So, excuse me. So an individuals, um, you know, through through your friend, through your partner, through your self, through different self-care activities and so on and so forth. This was done based on the interviews that uh, we conducted. So these set of coding were applied to the interviews um, that that followed the survey. The second level of coding, again, was um, in, involved productivity and unproductivity, lack of concentration, um, adjustments in writing to a new case, space and practices, to resources, to writing conditions, to uh, routine due to limited resources, to the nature of support, feeling demotivated, loss of control, feeling the unpredictability, feeling of failure, uncertainty, uncertainty about incentives, loss of social connection, feeling hopeless, a sense of purposelessness and helplessness, depressed, frustrated, stressed, feeling anxiety, limited self-care, not being able to de-stress, disruption due to living conditions in writing due to the factors out of hand. Limited accessibility due to remote, remote location, like physical books, as mentioned earlier, to resources due to pandemic lockdown. So these sets of coding were done based on the responses that we got from the interview. So these were all a lot. A lot of these were recurring themes or patterns that we, that I noticed as I was looking at these interviews. Finding um, so the as as I went to the interviews and kind of analyzed their responses and looked at the coding and tried to set them up in term, terms in order to re answer the research questions, I realized that their most struggles were finding opportunities as a writer, um, social isolation as a positive influence, more time to write. These were also part of the things that came up in the responses over and over again. Feedback on time, um, getting it in the same manner, getting delayed responses, getting explicit, not getting enough explicit responses, finding online media more accessible, but accessibility due to the online, online nature of writing. So a lot of these students, um, as I would mention in the findings as well, a lot of these students did 
try to make the best out of the situation by resorting to online feedback systems. So the online nature fighting, they thought that it was useful to them because the teachers could give them, you know, uh, instead of just putting handwritten comments, they could just resort to different links or they could just send them things that they would otherwise not have sent if they were doing it in person. Uh, but there were other issues like um, as mentioned in the survey as well, which uh, was brought up again in the interview, student immigration and visa policies that affected their writing uh, because uh, I remember two, two or three of the participants sharing how they just could not focus on their writing because they were constantly worried about um, how the, the situation is going to change for them, whether it's going to be something else next day, whether they had to pack their bags and whether they had to leave. So there was that and budget cuts, that was another issue. Uh, so some of the students talked about how, because a lot of these graduate students come into the program with assistantships or fundings. So how do a lot, and the, a lot of the programs had to close down in the last year because of funding issues, because of financial cutbacks. So how was those, how, how was that budget cut affecting their overall status as a graduate student? How, because a lot of them said that their funding has reduced because of the COVID-19 pandemic, because they had to do budget cuts. So, uh, students were stressed due to racial identities, racial and social inequalities, uh, leading to a sense of um, purposelessness and negotiating with different identities in writing, triggered by writing about in the pandemic uh, support, from the academic administrative resources, support from the, like I said, partner, emotional or writing wise, going to therapies because some of these participants said that they couldn't even access their therapists in this, in this time because they were no longer available. They had shut down their offices because of the, and it, did, it wasn't until much later that things opened up virtually for a lot of these professions. So they had this moment of crisis where they, was, they weren't sure how to reach out to someone and seek help. So there was that. Um, and, the, and the overall findings showed that the work-life balance and the mental health, mental health have had the strongest impact on the participating L2 graduate student writers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Social unrest and issues related to the presidential race and citizenship and immigration issues follow closely behind the first two. There is a likelihood that at least some of these issues are interconnected for these L2 student, uh, graduate student writers, like I said, um, social unrest or uh, like the, the mental health and immigration, these all could be interlinked, which just got exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic all the more. For instance, um, it's possible, like I said, um, this, um, you know, the social unrest, which a lot of people witnessed, and even if they were not part of that community, even if they were around it, and even if they were allies to it, it had affected them um, all the same. If they were constantly being, um, you know, uh, witness, they, they were constantly being a witness to those un, those issues issues going on around them. Most of the L two graduate student writers uh, who participated seem to have witnessed a change in infrastructure surrounding writing because of the COVID nineteen pandemic, and this has led to a shift to their writer identities as well. So a lot of people um, admitted that they had to figure out a way to make the most of it. While a lot of them struggled, some did succeed, but they had to kind of figure out how to uh, function within those limited spaces that they were given. So if they were someone who could um, benefit from explicit feedback or who could benefit from you know, uh, peer support in person, they had to make do with Zoom sessions. They had to make do with small catch-up sessions over the phone or over the video call. So they had to come up with all these alternatives um, that, that impacted their experiences. Uh, and one thing though that kind of like I'm still planning to extend on is um, whether, these, whether some of these uh, influences or these um, these um, impacts that they experienced is exclusive because they are L2 graduate student writers or is it something that a lot of other graduate student writers also faced during the pandemic? Um, so the immigration, the visa issues might have been something unique to them, but at the same time, I know a lot of uh, the other graduate student writers face similar mental health issues or work-life balance issues. So I want to go forward kind of focusing on 
which things kind of like drawing a contrastive analysis of like which experience has set them apart from say um, L1 students, L1 graduate student writers and kind of see if, if there is anything specific that makes their whole experience regarding the COVID-19 pandemic unique. So yeah, thank you. I, and like all questions are welcome. I hope I didn't go over the time, Lauren. Unmute. Uh, no, since we have three presenters instead of the original four, <clears throat> so everybody has plenty of time, so that's good. So thank you. Yeah, we'll have questions at the end, but also feel free to use the chat if you uh, have something that you, you want to answer right away, and, and we can probably go back and forth between the chat and uh, live questions when we get there. Okay, we have uh, one more presenter, Clement Labie. Did I spell that? Did I pronounce that at all close? Okay. That's wonderful. Okay. You're a P are you still a PhD student or have you? Uh, 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 not for very long, I hope, but uh, at the present time I am. Okay. So so you're a year farther along. I mean, at the University of Luxembourg. So I think you're the farthest away that I've, I've had uh, in, this, in these sessions. Your interests include legal philosophy, meta ethics, and the history of ideas, and you moon, you really you moonlight as a corporate lawyer and a manager in the field of private equity. So, uh, all right, let's all let's all hear your presentation now. Yeah. So, um, um, so yeah, because like I'm uh, okay. All right. Um. So. Does it look somewhat presentable now? Ah, yeah. Yes. All right. Yeah. L look at me. I'm using technology. That that's cool. Uh, okay. So my presentation is uh, called "Legal Rhetoric and Rules of Interpretation." That's uh, a very abstract and uh, a bit uh, uh, unengaging. Uh, I cannot title, but uh, I hope um, it will get better. Uh, that's uh, my name and uh, my face is uh, just the one you see on the picture. Um, okay, um, I want you to introduce to that fellow uh, on the right of the, um, of the screen called, uh, uh, well, his last name is Perelman. Uh, his first name is uh, kind of lost. Uh, we know he was uh, uh, known as a child. Uh, uh, late in his life, uh, it was probably, its real first name was probably Chaim. Uh, but it was not the name he was born uh, with. Uh, we know he was born in uh, in Warsaw, in Poland, uh, in the early um, 20th century. Uh, he immigrated as a as a youngster to Belgium, became a Belgian citizen, and is uh, uh, let's say um, the um, uh, the main uh, legal philosopher in the French speaking world, uh, at least in the 20th century. Um, he, um, his uh, masterpiece uh, is called uh, Logique Juridique, Nouvelle Rhetorique. So it's literally legal logic, new rhetoric. Uh, and it's a bit of a surprise uh, to uh, mix these two things together, logic and rhetoric, uh, because we have that old tradition that dates back from the days of uh, Socrates and Gorgias that uh, logic and rhetoric uh, were um, opposites. They have opposite ends, they have opposite purposes, and they have opposite means. So why did, um, what did Perelman did have in mind and what was he trying to say? Okay, uh, I'll start with uh, an example uh, that Perelman himself uh, uses. It's not his, but it's one of the main uh, easiest way to understand uh, what is trying to accomplish. You enter a park, a public park, and uh, you, uh, you see a sign, uh, the sign says, no dogs allowed. And look at that uh, uh, cute little bear on the left. Uh, the question is, the sign says, no dogs allowed. Will that uh, little fellow be allowed into the park? Look at it, it's almost unbearingly cute. Uh, so what's the answer? And the answer, says Perman, is even legally, is not easy to determine because uh, we have as many principles of interpretation, shall we say, so meta principles, 
what happens behind the law. When you have a written law, how are you supposed to construe the law? You have as many principles in favor than against. No dogs allowed. No dogs allowed. Bare load, because it's an contrario. So no dogs allowed. So a, a bear being a non-dog is allowed. Bear allowed, in dubio pro libertate. It means that when there is a doubt about interpretation of a legal rule, well, you should interp interpret that legal rule in favor of uh, freedom. So there's a freedom of, uh, you know, uh, walking your, your tent bear with a little leash uh, over there. That should be the, the winning solution. Uh, bear law because um, a criminal law, so the law that um, sets forth sanctions, shall we say, should be interpreted strictly. If it said no bears, it does not imply, it cannot imply other animals because if the law uh, wanted to say uh, all animals, you would have said no, uh, all animals, not only dogs. Okay, now you have three uh, rules of interpretation that would forbid the, uh, the bear, sorry, to enter into the park, which is, you know, forbidden to dogs. A fortiori, so that means that because we don't let the dogs uh, enter the park because they're messy, they bark, uh, they can bite people, with further reason, we should uh, not let a bear, which is messier, more dangerous, and whose bite is uh, more ferocious, enter the, the park either. Um, it's, there's also the unfortunate exceptions rule, it means that in the exceptions to law, which leads to terrible uh, consequences, we should not uh, let the, the, the terrible interpretation work. And also uh, um, the United Kingdom, for instance, has also rules of strict interpretation of criminal law, unless it leads to an absurd result. So if, if the, the actually the rule which was clearly meant to protect park goers uh, from being eaten or, or bitten, um, that rule should also be like uh, extended to more dangerous animals. And look at that poor thing on, on the left. It's clearly miserable about those lawyers not letting him enter to the park. So personally, I think it would be a, a bright idea to let him in. But in, it goes to tell you that uh, um, the, the level of specification, right, uh, that you, you want to introduce into law is never enough to cover the full let's say uh, the full formulation of the rule of law. There's always things between the cracks. And if you want to justify that this rule of interpretation should be the one winning over the other rule, then you have another issue. In, in, a, in a further to which rule, are you favoring one rule of interpretation over the other? And if you select that rule, in, in, a, in a furtherance of ritual, did you select that rule? Ad infinitum, right? All the way um, to the top, right? Uh, Perman says that, okay, you, we have syllogism in law, but actually the importance is to convince what is so as a universal audience. So, uh, his reference, his emphasis of the audience is a clear reference to uh, uh, Aristotle uh, because it's the beginning of rhetorics. Rhetorics is the convincing or the persuading of an audience. So he says, okay, it's not, it, it is logical, but it's also, uh, there's also like a, a concrete result, which is um, the privilege, the, the, the birthmark of legal, uh, legal pleading, legal argumentation, which I translate that. I'm not saying that pleading is sophistry, but I'm also not not saying that, all right? So I was talking about that classical dialogue uh, were actually uh, written, of course, by Plato, uh, Gorgias between uh, Socrates and, uh, and, uh, and Gorgias, uh, named Gorgias, uh, between the tenets of philosophy as a discloser, revealer, uh, of truth behind the words. 
and gorgeous who said, well, actually there's no truth behind the words. The truth is in the words. There's no, nothing that goes beyond that. And so it's, it's a very touching dialogue actually because Plato um, was a very um, admiring uh, student of so so um, Socrates would not let Socrates win in that dialogue. They just disagree. They just disagree and Socrates, uh, Socrates does not get an artificial win over the tenets of uh, the um, the, um, the idea of oral uh, spoken uh, verbal discussion and, uh, and uh, uh, conviction is actually very, uh, um, common uh, in the legal process. Uh, you, I, I wrote a, a small article a couple of months ago about why uh, in some countries, uh, uh, not in all countries, statute of justice is blind because it's not, the process of justice is not uh, a visual medium. It's, a, it's an oral verbal medium. You have hearings, okay? And you have a strange, but also kind of a beautiful tradition of blind lawyers and blind uh, legal professors. It's actually one of the very few professions where blind people are not severely uh, handicapped uh, um, uh, compared to uh, uh, seeing people. So um, the legal profession is uh, the art of oral persuasion. Okay. Okay, so the fellow on your right is not a serial uh, killer. Despite his uh, its photograph, it's uh, uh, one of the main, uh, the most uh, important philosophers of the 20th century. That's uh, Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein. Um, Perlman was uh, uh, had a complicated life. Uh, Wittgenstein had a doubly complicated life. Uh, he was the, um, the scion, the heir of uh, the heir of the, a very rich family in Vienna. Um, uh, two of his brothers committed suicide. Uh, one other tried, he tried a couple of times. He had a very depressed life. And he had the first philosophy, um, first, let's say, trend of philosophy when he destroyed philosophy. And when he was tired of getting that, he had another philosophy, uh, which is uh, uh, um, pretty much consisting of um, language games. All right, he was trying to uh, look at words together and see uh, in the common language, how our understanding of language and how language of understanding uh, would actually work. Okay. This is in our philosophical investigations. I I'll read it aloud. It does the proposition. Any interpretation still hangs in the air along with what it interprets and cannot give it any support. Interpretations by themselves do not determine, determine meaning. Example. Now imagine a game of chess translating according to certain rules into a series of actions which would not ordinarily associate with a game. Say, into yells and stamping of feet. And now suppose two, those two people to yell and stamp instead of playing the form of chess that we are used to. And this is in such a way that their procedure is translatable by suitable rules into a game of chess. So should we still be inclined to say they were playing game what right would one have to say so? Okay, so they have a system. So one is yelling, that means uh, move my pawn two squares. Uh, one is dancing, that means uh, um, uh, rook to, uh, to e5, for instance. Okay, that could mean a lot of other things, but you have some kind of instruction manual that translates those silly actions into, okay, uh, uh, dancing means uh, rook to e5. No conclusion, no course of action could be determined by a rule because any course of action could be made to accord with the rule. What does that mean? Okay, that means that every type of practical solution could be seen as a confirmation of the rule, but also a confirmation of another rule. So does that mean that he's made a, a precedent? So does that mean that his advance is weak? Or is that coach for I'm really tired or is it a sign that uh, that uh, uh, winter is going to come uh, 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 a little later in life? Here comes that uh, that guy that was the first that uh, took Wittgenstein's that part of Wittgenstein really seriously. His name is uh, Saul Kripke. is uh, is the only guy uh, still alive in my presentation. That's pretty blessing. Okay, but look look at at that uh, beard and smile. Uh, that's a man that really appreciates life. Okay. 
It takes the following example. Uh, when you learn mathematics, don't learn mathematics, you learn counting, right? One plus zero equals one. One plus one is two. One plus two is three and so forth, okay? But you start with little numbers, small numbers. You never reach a number that's say greater than 57. According to Wittgenstein uh, philosophical, in, philosophical investigation, you could, you could guess, for instance, under the influence of drugs or whatever, that that plus over there does not mean addition, but addition if x and y are below 57, all right? But when you take the x and y that are above uh, 57, the result is five. Question, how can you convince that person that is wrong? And the answer that Kripke um, brings is uh, a bit disappointing because they say we can't. The only clue we have that uh, plus always means addition is that everyone, everyone seems to consider that plus means addition. Uh, uh, Wittgenstein said that there could not be a private language, okay? If there's a language that implies the community of speakers that uh, construe the language, language in the same way, it could not be, for me alone, it could not be plus equal, equals a certain value under 57, a certain value after 57. So that, that's, that's to, to come back to that, uh, um, to that uh, uh, example I gave about the bear, the bear, sorry. Well, uh, well um, th there's, there's a moment when um, there is no, an obstacle in interpretation, which is there is no rule that could guarantee that a rule of interpretation is better than one other rule of interpretation because they are not contradictory. Okay, when they say a fortiori and uh, a contrario, they kind of imply something else. But what, wh what is that something else? That a fortiori means that the two situations you're comparing are comparable. Okay, uh, and that you kind of guess the intention of uh, the lawmaker to include something more in the law that, however, does not contain the words you want it to contain. But it's also, when you do that, you implicitly call upon a law which says, okay, in case of that, what did the lawmaker intend? Which is like a, a, a question which is not entirely settled by the Supreme Court, for instance, because some judges say, okay, it should be the, uh, the, uh, the current meaning. Some say, okay, it was the meaning meant by the lawmakers. No, it was the meaning we should take into consideration. I think um, the, the, um, that lady that was uh, appointed uh, in 2020 said, okay, no, it was the meaning that was com commonly accepted by the, the people at the time that uh, the, the law was enacted. And to determine which of these law of depressions uh, you need to pick, well, you need another law. Okay, that brings us to that guy. Uh, that his name is Hans Kelsen. So there's a debate in, uh, in legal philosophy. It sounds kind of silly, but I'll, I'll, I'll um, pose, I'll ask these questions as simply and as clear as I can. Is the law just the law that is uh, sanctioned, um, recognized, written, uh, I'm not, I'm trying to think of uh, other words, enacted, and that's all. Or is the law a set of universal principles that apply even though they are not currently respected or enacted in one uh, particular system of law? Okay, if there is a law, is there a law, for instance, uh, thou shalt not kill, that applies, even if you are a Nazi and you really want to kill that person. That was the question of the, uh, well, the question of the Nuremberg 
uh, trails, by the way. Okay, is there a universal um, uh, ban on killing? Okay, and his theory is that he, he was uh, nominally he was in favor of he was called, he was what we call a positivist, i.e., the, the only law is the enacted law. But he posited that above uh, above the the the, um, the enacted law, there was what they call the Grundnorm in German, a basic law that was superior to everything. So a kind of meta uh, constitution, hyper constitution, something above the above, which is a highly mystical principle. Okay, and what is that rule norm? Well, we'll never know because he died without, uh, without uh, uh, writing uh, uh, about it. Uh, also, I suppose, because the, the, the answer is incredibly uh, difficult to, to give. All right, so we see that um, in, in rhetoric, that was the position of Perelman. In rhetoric, um, the, the art of, uh, of uh, persuasion, especially in legal matters, was to favor implicit, hidden, um, um, let's call them uh, um, you know, sometimes we're talking about, uh, um, I don't find another synonym, but uh, the law between the law and the law above the law and saying, okay, this is how you should interpret the law. And this question of uh, which version of uh, interpretation rules is, the, is uh, better or the best is something that cannot be decided rationally. All right, uh, that, was, that was the point that's being made. Uh, um, the, the difficulty is that um, actually like uh, uh, lawyers are not very interested in philosophy. They are too busy being lawyers. However, they fight uh, a lot about uh, what they see uh, empirically as the uh, obvious response. But the obvious is not obvious to, to uh, anyone. Okay. And um, uh, maybe one solution is one of legal uh, pluralism. It's either legal pluralism saying, okay, there are either different solutions with the uh, um, competing um, value or uh, something, for instance, that the child would does, they say, okay, there are those rules of interpretation and you're not allowed to pick others. And those rules apply in those and those situations. Otherwise, we all screwed. We could not agree on one version of, uh, of reality uh, because we don't have, the, um, there's no uh, razor that could get uh, things the right place. Thank you very much to all. Unmute. There we go. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. I, I, I realized we had in this because it was online. And so we had uh, people who couldn't come to the in person session. So I'm really glad we were able to get together uh, a wide variety of ideas and presentations here. Um, does anybody have any questions? As I said, you can unmute and ask a question of one of the speakers or one of your fellow panelists, or you can go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, and let people respond that way, whichever uh, you are comfortable with. Are there any questions here? <clears throat> Manira, I, I was going to ask you uh, what. Um, perhaps you were you were hinting at that towards the end. What is the goal of this data that you've gathered as we move, hopefully, out of the pandemic? Is this something that's going to change the way services are delivered, or how is it going to work? That's thank you. That's actually a good question because I think part of why um, I'm extending this um, as like making this bigger is because I want to address that specific issue um, because I know we are in a much better position in terms of COVID nineteen and handling things, but um, I know there are still areas where students are you know, feeling that need of support. So uh, my goal is to hopefully come up with alternative solutions, like better solutions that might equip 
you know, a program or the student or the writers better to, to have that sort of fallback solution in case of a scenario like this. So because a lot of these um, issues arise as most of the like faculties or the institutions, uh, the stakeholders, students had very little clue as to what they should do in order to handle things or in order to what is the alternative, uh, like figuring out Zoom had been a bane of my existence for the last good half of my last year. And even though like I think I'm, I get used to technology pretty fast. And even then I had like very, very big issues dealing with Zoom. And Zoom fatigue was actually a thing that a lot of people talked about because continuously talk, going in and out of Zoom classes or attending these conferences or even sessions, it wasn't easy for, for the whole of last year. So what are some of the other alternative methods instead of just pushing um, you know, for just as video calls or like cl online classes, what are some alternative methods that might help the students come, you know, deal with their anxieties um, or surrounding their writing? Or what are some of the ways they could seek support even if they are not able to do so physically? So maybe I, I want to look at those aspects and I know that I have a lot of raw data at this point, but I'm not, I haven't yet processed all of it yet. So hopefully I will be able to get to that question um, after I've had some analysis done. I mean, maybe next year at UCLA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> hopefully. Um, Sarah, um, I don't know if you're, yeah, I was going to ask you a little, I, maybe I missed it in your presentation. I, I'm assuming that your, your department focuses on argumentative rhetoric. Is that correct? Thanks, Sarah. I think, I don't know if she's muted. Sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't. Oh, okay. Muted. There it goes. Sorry. Yeah, yes, no, I, I made the same mistake earlier, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's argumentative, How, does, do you, does your department ever do other kinds of approaches uh, besides argumentative reflective or, and how does, how does this type of um, approach work with other types? Uh, the department focus, we focus a lot, yes, on argumentative writing, especially in the second um, second semester composition course. That's really the focus of it. Um, and so the, I think the thing that's very different about this approach um, is that it's writing for specifically for social action, um, where a lot of the uh, strategies that people are using or that the department wanted to use was this kind of research, um, research paper type of writing, and it would be uh, perhaps an argumentative research paper. Um, the problem that I see with that is, I mean, it's not a, a huge problem, but a problem I see with it is that students feel really no connection to that, to the point of that research paper. It's essentially being written to no one out in the universe sometimes, even if they have an imagined audience. Um, it's not a real genre that the audience would actually look at. And so that's kind of the difference, I think, with this approach. And then in the, in the comp one class or in the first semester composition class, it is a lot more focused on, on things like narrative and profile writing, um, specific analysis and things like that. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I was just, because my department does as well, that it's argumentative, but I've also often found, I try to introduce more reflective writing, maybe in low stakes writing assignments, mm -hmm. so they can step back and see how was I arguing or who was I arguing with and maybe analyze it a little bit so that that there's there's more context for it. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it, in, a, in, a, in an argument based program, you're sometimes, um, it's, you're, your options are sort of set out for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had a, a, a little bit of a, I'm gonna be one of those people and not so much a question as a comment, um, but I, I was looking at, at what you're trying now. In, in Renaissance rhetoric, we had the, um, the image of the closed fist and the open hand. You, you were talking in the beginning about logic and rhetoric. 
and the closed fist of logic because there there wasn't any fudging that. Um, and then the open hand of rhetoric, which is where you were trying to reach out to people and, and convince them where there was not a, a, a set answer, but you were trying to convince. So I'm, I'm taking it, you're, you're trying to push the parameters of those a little bit or um, uh, in terms of how a rhetorician or how a composition teacher might work with this, how do those two categories maybe mix with each other or? That's a pretty interesting question because uh, it, is, uh, it is very, very, um, easy to think that uh, the sophists uh, were very much more open-minded than uh, the philosophers, uh, because the philosophers, like uh, uh, you know, uh, these old guys, Plato, they would allow uh, uh, ideas and opinions as long as they were not too different from theirs, and as long as they could, uh, or as long as they could refute them in less than uh, thirty seconds. But the surface, you know, well, they were all for for the expression, imagination, designing of of uh, many ideas. Actually, that's how they made a living, and they made a living of uh, convincing other people. Uh, uh, your question also touches back to to very um, difficult question, which is to say, uh, is it possible to hold one possible uh, objective truth, one only objective truth? Uh, when your mind is opened all the time to everything? Or should it close at one time? And on which criteria uh, should it close? And, and that's, not, that's not an easy um, uh, question to answer. Uh, I have my opinion on the subject. I think, I, I don't like to state it, but I think it's pretty obvious. But, but the, the general idea that um, you know, the, a closed fist is a closed fist. It's not, uh, it's not uh, a pat on the back, right? Uh, well, you, you, go to, you go to your stepmother and say, well, she, she welcomed me with a closed fist. Say, well, that's not a good sign. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, um, but, but, but people who are certain about the truth, they all, always have closed fists. Have you noticed? They never wave or they never shake your hands. They, they have those, it, it's certainty over there. Right. There's nothing that could uh, that could break that. Okay. Um, any any of the panelists have any questions or any of the audience we have? Um, <clears throat> I want to thank you again for coming and for being really part of the inaugural episode of, of Pamela Online. So uh, it'll be interesting to see where, where we end up next year, but I do hope some of you can make it to UCLA. That's my alma mater. So I'm looking forward to going to the next panel. So I hope I see at least some of you in person and if not online, all right? Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. You're welcome. Thank you very much. You're welcome.